and welcome to today's episode of Daily Debrief brought to you by People's Dispatch. I'm Swastika and let's take a look at today's stories. On Friday, progressive activists from around the world will take part in the Belmarsh Tribunal organized by the Progressive International. In this tribunal, the US war on terror will be put on trial and once again, the demand for Julian Assange's freedom will be raised. So the tribunal will gather leading figures from politics, the law, and journalism to shed light on the US crimes that were revealed by WikiLeaks, torture, violence, illegal spying, but also to speak about the existing crimes of both US and UK against Julian Assange for exposing their illegal and unjustifiable actions. Now, to know more about the Belmarsh Tribunal, we're joined by Prashant in our studio. Thank you, Prashant, for coming back to our show. Thank you. So, Prashant, what is the significance of this uh, Belmarsh tri Tribunal? Right. So, Swastika, it's two aspects that are really important in this context, of course. One is the fact that uh, this takes place after the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan. Yeah. And uh, I think nothing shows how true WikiLeaks was than the botched U.S. war on so-called terror you so-called U.S. war on terror, which was launched in 2001. And WikiLeaks and Julian Assange, they released a lot of documents on the war in Afghanistan, on the war in Iraq, on the complete anarchy and chaos, the wrong, uh, the misguided intentions, the malice with which the U.S. and the Western powers prosecuted these wars. Yeah. And let's be very honest, the reason Julian Assange is in jail today, the reason he's been in confinement for close to a decade now, is because he exposed uh, these war crimes is yes. because he exposed how flawed U.S. policies were. Now, the U.S. accuses him of being, uh, you know, involved in spying. There are like, I think, 18 charges against him. Yeah, and he's, of course, in Britain. So we'll talk more about the case details later. But the fact is that this is really the context with uh, which we need to see it. Of course, next week, there's also a hearing with Julian Assange. The latest information revealed that in 2017, when Donald Trump was in power, the CIA had thought of assassinating Julian Assange because they were so embarrassed by the leak of Vault 7 documents. Now, what is Vault 7? Vault 7 is a list of CIA spying tools. And WikiLeaks released it to show the world what kind of capability CIA has, what CIA is probably doing across the world. So this caused a lot of embarrassment in the CIA and there were talks of, you know, maybe kidnapping him and bringing him to the United States. There were talks of assassinating him. Yeah. There were talks of, you know, uh, in fact, I believe, a lot of WikiLeaks journalists, they were pursued, they were surveilled and, you know, there was all kinds of discussions around it. So, uh, this kind of shows the extent to which WikiLeaks and Julian Assange have been targeted. And I said, I think it's very important for all of us to remember that he is being prosecuted, he is being tortured for being a journalist. Now, the US and its allies might want to call him a spy. You know, they're, they're, he's been, like I said, he's been charged under the Espionage Act in the United States. But what he has done is what journalists do. Journalists receive information from sources. In this case, it was Chelsea Manning. Journalists receive information from sources who are often associated with the government. They publish this information, which reveals the side of the state, that we, the government that we do not want to see. And this is always how uh, these kind of systems have worked. Journalism has worked. And this is the real crime in the sense that the US government, the British government, they do not want people to accept that Assange is a journalist because if they accept that Assange is a journalist then automatically they accept what Assange's work is and what Assange's work is is unveiling the true picture of uh, the US imperialism across the world. So I think that's really you know the larger picture behind this. These are the two aspects that we need to see and without seeing these two aspects we really do not know, we, we really, really can't understand what why Julian Assange is being persecuted. Also actually um if you could tell us more about the case itself, what is the latest on the trial on Julian Assange? Right. So uh, next week, there's going to be another hearing. It's basically okay. an appeal by the United States. We know that in January, a uh, judge, a uh, British judge had declared that Julian Assange should not be extradited from the United Kingdom to the United States. Mm -hmm. And this was on account of the fact that he was considered a suicide risk. Mm -hmm. And we need to remember that Assange has been undergoing a lot of torture. There is no other word for what he has been facing over the years. He was cooped up in the Ecuadorian embassy for the longest time in various charges which have now been dropped. Uh, he was surveilled by, uh, now there are records which show that US intelligence worked with the company to actually spy on him. His partner and his children's details were unnecessarily leaked. So there was, there was a whole range of torture that he has undergone over the years. And 
in April 9, 2019, he was dragged out of the Ecuadorian embassy and put in prison. He spent the whole of COVID-19 in prison. And this is despite the fact that a number of experts have pointed out that his psychological state is very, very bad. And, you know, he remains at various levels of suicide risk. So in January, a British judge agreed that there was a suicide risk and so that he should not be transferred to the United States, where prison conditions, by the way, are horrible. That is a key point. But the same judge refused to give him bail, although she said that he could not be extradited. Mm. He said, the same judge refused to give him bail because they said that the US government could appeal this decision. So this appeal is what is going to be heard on October 27th. Recently, the High Court has actually expanded the scope of the appeal. Mm. So now the prosecution, which is basically British lawyers supported by the US, can appeal the January judgment under many more counts. What the US wants basically is to bring him to the United States and make him an example is to make uh, make him undergo harsh prison conditions you know like i said there are 18 charges the overall prison term for those charges is 175 years in prison now it, irrespective of how many years he might get it will still basically destroy his life yeah it's a life sentence exactly and like i said all this boils down to the simple fact that uh, what wikileaks did was reveal the cruelty of war yeah what is considered decent what is considered common sense what is considered knowledge, you know, basic human decency by all people, that war is a bad thing, yeah. that war should not be waged you know, in, any, in, a, in any unnecessary way. And we know that the US war on Iraq, for instance, was utterly unnecessary. So when we see the kind of processes that went on in US government at that point of time, yeah. the fact that they had no idea what they were doing, all this is now clear mm -hmm. from Afghanistan. Yes. All this is now clear from the violence on Iraq. At the same time, Assange and WikiLeaks revealed this years ago. And that's why they can't take it. So uh, it's it's a very, very unfortunate scene as we know it. It's a, a threat to journalists across the world. Very important thing to note. I don't think media and journalists across the world have been cognizant enough in understanding the significance of the proceedings against Assange. Because what it means is that at some point, any journalistic activity which challenges the state, which reveals truths that are uncomfortable for the state, could be classified as espionage could be classified as threat to national security. We are seeing this in many countries already where journalists are being targeted. Julian Assange's case is probably one of the most important ones right now because of the extent of what he was able to reveal. Mm. So important week next week to look forward. In to terms both of Belmarsh as well as yes, uh, the yes. Belmarsh Tribunal as well as the Absolutely. Pro uh, proceedings on the trial. Right. Thank you, Prashant. Let's move on to our next story. Recently, reports of China testing a hypersonic missile caused alarm in the Western media, as happens with a lot of news about China. Now, the missile in question is believed to be capable of carrying nuclear warheads, and its development has reportedly taken U.S. intelligence agencies by surprise. We have with us Prabir Purkayasta in the studio to talk more about this. Now, Prabir, um, if you could tell us, what is the technology behind this missile in question? Well, what is the designation of the missile is more important in this case. It's called hypersonic because it exceeds the speed of sound. These missiles just don't exceed the speed of sound. They exceed it by Mach 5 or more, which okay. means five times the speed of sound or more. So therefore, it is believed that it is very difficult to track these missiles, particularly as they are also in a glide mode and therefore hug the surface of the earth much more closely. Okay. So your normal anti-ballistic missiles, which you shoot down, Missiles which go up and come down, therefore, do not become effective against these kind of missiles. Therefore, your ABM b batteries, which mm. is what the United States is building up, is not effective against this. So that is one of the reasons, of course, the U.S. always uh, talks about the danger from hypersonic missiles. And uh, that's why they seem to have suddenly got much more worried about it. Of course, did China really do a hypersonic missile or not? That is still an open question. Okay. Also, why is there such a buzz in the Western media about the fact that China has gone ahead and tested this missile? Have other countries also gone ahead and carried a similar test? Well, the first is, has China tested this oh, yeah. missile itself is open to yes. question. Yes. Because China has said they're really doing a test of a vehicle which would come back to Earth after it has launched something, it can come back to Earth. So it's really uh, sub something which a lot of the test vehicles today are doing. So it's nothing new. It's a quite old as a technology. This is something which is known to all uh, countries which send space 
shuttles and other stuff. So I think that worry that the American intelligence is supposed to have shown itself is a question mark. You asked also whether other countries have it. Yes, uh, the Russians have tested it. The Americans have recently tested one and they're going to, they're in the production mode of developing more of these missiles. Uh, China, of course, has tested one uh, two, a couple of years back. So Dongfeng uh, 17, I think DF-17 is the name of the missile. That's a hypersonic missile and that's been known to exist for quite some time. And North Korea is supposed to have recently tested one as well. India is also developing hypersonic missiles. Yeah. So I'm little surprised at the sudden shock and awe in the American intelligence about so-called Chinese hypersonic missile test. Neither its existence nor its test, if it really did happen, should be a shock to anybody. Well, the Western media seems to be extra sensitive to any news that comes out of China. Thank you, Prabhi, for joining us. Now, moving on to our next story. The 26th UN Climate Change Conference of the Parties will be held in Glasgow from October 31st to November 12th. Now, this is an extremely vital conference which will deal with the issue of climate change and the role of countries in combating it. Over the past few years, we have seen extreme climate events like droughts, flooding, hurricanes and wildfires, many of which have been attributed to climate change. On the other hand, countries across the world have failed to take significant enough action to mitigate climate change. In fact, ahead of the conference, a huge leak of documents reveals that a number of countries and organizations are arguing that the world does not need to reduce the use of fossil fuels as quickly as the current draft of the report recommends. We spoke to D. Raghunandan of Delhi Science Forum about what is the significance of this conference and why is it important. So, Raghu, could you start by telling us about what is on the agenda of COP26 and what kind of an impact these discussions might or are expected to have? Um, that's a million dollar question. Uh, COP26 really is slated to arrive at a solid understanding of the way forward. Uh, since the Paris Agreement in 2015-16, uh, this was the year slated for updating the uh, pledges or the commitments made by different countries and to scale them up. Uh, it was, of course, supposed to be held last year, but then with COVID and all that, it's come to this year. So we were expecting all countries to come with uh, very... Uh, large-scale uh, updating of their NDCs, uh, which would have brought us closer to the uh, requirement to keep temperature rise to, uh, as the Paris Agreement's target was, well below 2 degrees Celsius or reaching 1.5 degrees Celsius. That was the goal, and that is what is expected from this meeting. Uh, several preliminary meetings and even summits uh, have been held to take this process forward, to, uh, in a sense, ramp up the pressure on each other uh, to raise their uh, ambitions. Several countries have responded and raised their ambitions, but many have not. Uh, and that's what we are going to confront uh, in Glasgow. Right. So in this context, the next question would be, why is this really an important space to watch? And at the same time, does it are there any limitations to the kind of discussions that might take place? Uh, well, two major uh, things. One, of course, is to watch out for the outcome. Uh, according to calculations done by the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, which uh, whose report was released uh, less than a month ago, but which has broadly been ignored in the media compared to the shock and awe with which the IPCC's uh, sixth assessment report was uh, received. But the UNFCCC's assessment of a of a of uh, the totality of NDCs submitted, including their updated uh, versions, show that we are far behind the target. The target was to reduce uh, emissions 
to 45% below 2010 levels by the year 2030. And this shows us that even with all these NDCs having come in, we are actually 16% more than the 2010 levels. So unless there is going to be some major push at Glasgow during the summit itself, the figures coming in to the summit are extremely disappointing and in fact scary. Because if this is where we are now, with just 10 years to go for the 2030 limit, then the world is in serious trouble. And we have already seen that just with a 1.1 degree rise in temperature, we've seen the havoc that climate change has caused in extreme weather events, in fires in Europe, uh, forest fires in North America, in the US and Canada, floods in Germany, and of course, recurrent floods, landslides, uh, cyclones, what have you around the Indian subcontinent. And finally, in our very last segment, former US President Donald Trump plans to launch a new app called Truth Social, which he plans as a rival to the big tech companies that have shut him out and denied him the megaphone that was paramount to his national rise. Actually, let's go back to Prashant. And Prashant, how soon are you opening an account on this app? Good question, Swastika. I mean, I'm a bit scared by the name, I'll admit that, because, yeah. you know, Facebook and Twitter are bad enough. Sadly, one has to be on that. But Trump's uh, uh, company is going, uh, forum is going to be called Truth Social. And it's the truth is ironic because of all the people in the world, Trump who has his record of, you know, lying. Uh, for, absolutely, there's no way of, you know, no way of showing. Corroborating his it, facts. It's just pure lies. Yeah. You know, it's like he lied left, right and center day and night. And also called everyone else who corrected him as spreading fake news. Yeah. So, a uh, scary thought about what this new social media entity is going to be. Let's be honest, it'll probably crash and burn because the right-wing social media attempts in the past have not really sort of, uh, you know, taken off in any meaningful way. The important thing to note, however, is that Trump remains popular despite the fact that across the world people hmm. could, uh, you know, people disliked him across, despite the fact that Americans disliked him, despite the fact that he lost the election. Trump remains hugely popular among Republicans. In fact, he's actually changed a lot of how the Republican Party functions. He's changed a lot of how Republicans think in terms of politics, mm. which means that, for instance, there are still a lot of people who believe that the election in November 2020 in the US was stolen from mm. Trump. And, you know, that's an enduring myth that, you know, various officials together combined to rig the elections is a fact that a large section of the Republican uh, voter base continues to believe. So Trump has actually changed the very nature of the right wing in the United States. And uh, it's uh, it's probably good that, you know, while we generally don't endorse censorship, it's probably good that the big social media companies stopped giving him that space because otherwise he was just going on spreading in re real fake news, for lack of a better word, hmm. on some of these forums. So uh, I guess what this will create is yet another echo chamber for Trump to sort of, you know, spread continue spreading his messages. Uh, he has been successful in retaining, like I said, voter popularity, popularity among his supporters. Yeah. So good question about how it's going to look and feel. You might want to sort of create an uh, alt account since that's what everyone is into and oh, no. check. But yeah, I mean, uh, nonetheless, a slightly dangerous yeah. syndrome. We'll probably see the real impact of all this in a few years as the election cycles grow closer. Yeah, social, um, yeah, the social media will get impacted with this truth app should it come about. Truth. Thank you, Prashant, for this little input. And that's all we have on Daily Debrief today. Come back to us tomorrow and do keep following us on People Dispatch.